The next step is error handling. And we've got to have a really big, big conversation about error handling because we need to have a very clear understanding of what error handling means to us before we can sort of implement it into the system. So let's have the, that conversation. For me, error handling means three things. Handling an error means three things. You might have more, but I think these are the three core things that have to happen uh, when a piece of code is handling an error. The first thing that happens is that error has to be logged. And that error only gets logged once. Once, not multiple times. So if code is going to handle an error, then it's its job to log that error. Number two, the error has to be reviewed and it has to be determined whether or not um, that Go routine or the program itself now needs to be terminated. Can the error, can we recover from the error? That's really the second question. Can we recover? Can we do something to put the state of that Go routine or the app back in and keep going? Or is this particular Go routine or app done and we've got to shut this thing down? That has to be determined. And the last thing here is that the error doesn't propagate anymore. If you're handling the error, once you're done handling it, it's not an error anymore. You might produce a new error from that, that's fair, but that error shouldn't propagate anymore, all right? So these are the things that we're looking at for error handling. Now, one other way I kind of look at error handling is as a signaling mechanic, and I wanna share that with you. Um, when you think about channels for a second, let's go back to like channels. When we talk about channels, we talk about the idea that a channel really implements a signaling semantic. That's why we always say receiver and sender. There's a, there's a go routine sending a signal s across that channel. And so it's a signaling semantic. However, when it comes to channels, the signaling semantic in this case I would call it a horizontal signaling semantic. It's horizontal signaling. It's one G to another G. I think of error handling as signaling as well. But instead of this idea of a horizontal signaling, I think of it as vertical signaling. I wanna share that with you. Now, back in the early, early days of Go, Rob Pike, wrote a blog post about errors in Go. And he said something that at the time I had zero clue. It was so simple, but it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't mean anything. Rob Pike said, errors are just values. Period. Done. Errors are just values. It didn't mean anything to me for several years. And now I understand how profound that statement is. I want you to think about errors in Go as just values. And that value could have any sort of state and behavior that is needed to help us identify the full context of the problem so we can determine how to deal with it. I want you to think about errors as values that signal information about a problem that's occurring in the system. I think of error values as signals, very much as the way we think about values going through a channel. These are values going through the call stack, through the interface, the error interface, which for me acts like a pipeline of receiving, of sending and receiving these error signals. And so every single error value represents a different sort of error signal about a problem that's occurring. And hopefully it has the full context to allow us to make the best informed decision on how to handle the error. So let me give you an example. Let's say we've got some a function in the application layer. It's calling a function into the business layer. 
which calls a function into the foundation layer, which calls a function into the standard library, right? We're even crossing layers here. And every one of these functions has the typical uh, error interface type as the return. And so the way I think about that error interface is like this. I think of the error interface as this pipe. Now, what happens? Let's say we're down here in the call stack and we made some standard library call and it's failing. So what does the standard library do? It constructs some concrete type and what it does is it takes this concrete type and it puts it into the error interface, some concrete type, and it passes it up to the calling function. Now, we've all seen error not equals nil. What does this actually mean, error not equals nil? Let's explore that for a second. We know that all interfaces in Go, all interface values, regardless of the name of which type, is a two-word data structure. Two-word data structure where each word is a pointer. The first pointer points to an, another data structure that we call the I table. And the second pointer points to whatever the concrete type value is that's being stored inside the interface. Now, I tables are too technical. So even though there's a pointer here, what I like to do is just say that the first word represents the type of value being stored, and the second word is a pointer to that value of that type. That type could be value semantics or pointer semantics, but this is what we have. Now, when an interface value is empty or set to its zero value, both of these pointers are nil. But when there's a value stored inside the interface, they're not nil. So when you see error not equals nil, what I want you to do is read that as, is there a value stored inside the error interface? I want you to read that as, is there a concrete value stored inside? Because if there is a concrete value stored inside, what does that mean? We got an error. If there's no concrete value, we're clean. So this is nil, this is not nil. So is there a value stored inside the error interface? Is there a value stored inside the pipeline? Are we being signaled a value? Now in this case, this foundational level function is gonna say what? Oh yeah, yeah, there's a value stored there. Damn, we've got a problem. Now, every function has to make a decision. Am I gonna handle the error? Now, based on the policies and the rules I've given you so far, is this function allowed to handle the error? No, that's right, Camille, no, why? Because that function's not allowed to log because it's in the foundation layer. And part of handling an error means logging it. So in all reality, no foundation level code is actually allowed to handle errors. If you're not allowed to handle an error, then what do you do? You have only one choice. You have to wrap it with more context and send it back up the pipeline. Send the signal. And so what F has to do now is take this error and wrap it with more context and send it up. Now, here's a business layer function. And it says, hey, there's an error in the, is there a concrete value stored inside the error interface? The answer is yes, we're being signaled an error. Now the business layer says, um, do I wanna handle this error? And the business layer is allowed to handle it because it's allowed to log. So it says, yes, I'm gonna handle the error. So what does it do? It logs the error. It looks at the error to determine what it needs to do. The more granular 
your error signals are, the more granular the response can be, but less is also more, so we don't wanna be, we don't, have, we don't wanna have 30 of these signals, but you know, a handful, remember the rule of five? Three to five signals can work very, very well, and then it does whatever the logic is related to that error, even determining if we need to shut down a Go routine or an app. And then when it returns, because it's gonna handle the error, the error stops, it returns, we're good now. That, that's what it has to do. It either terminates or it says we're good. Pretty cool. So I wanna think about errors as signals. Different signals mean different things, and we can build logic around this idea that if we get an error signal of this type, we do this, error signal of this type, we do that. And thanks to the fact that this is a web API, we can do all of that error handling in a piece of middleware at the business level and make sure that the handlers don't ever do any error handling at all. They need to pass all the error handling to the error middleware so we have consistency and no problem. If I see any handlers doing any sort of error handling, that's gonna stop a code review right away. So this is our logic. This is our understanding. Now, with all of that, we need to think about the different error signals that we want for this web application. I will tell you that right now we have essentially three custom error types or signals. The first one is what I call an application error or what I like to call sometimes is a known error. Why do I call it a, it, it a known error? How many times, have, or I shouldn't say known, I apologize. The word isn't known, the word is trusted. I apologize. I call it an app, an app error or, or another word for it is a trusted error. I'll ask, we'll get to that question at the break. A trusted error. Why do I use that word trusted? How many times have you been in a restaurant and saw the, the point of sale system blow up and they gave you way too much information about what the problem was? And then times you walk near a gas station and they're using window machines and it's blown up and they've given you way too much information. <laughs> Airports, okay. Any ASP.net app, <laughs> here's the problem, right? Too much information tends to be made public when things fail. Information that really isn't trusted. So if the system sees an error that it doesn't know, it should only be returning a 500 with no information whatsoever because the risk is too great. But we do need an error signal or an error type that we, that we are gonna consider is trusted. We trust the information that's inside of it to be delivered back to the caller. We have to be very careful with these trusted errors. We have to make sure that we're not leaking information. But we do need this sort of trusted error at times because we do have to provide information so somebody can correct what they're doing. So we're gonna have our non-trusted, and then we're gonna have our trusted errors. We're gonna have two more signals as well. We're gonna have what I'm gonna call a shutdown signal. There needs to be a single point of code where we can signal the application itself to shut down when we've identified an integrity issue. And that point of code has to also have some sort of checks and balances around it. To give you an example of this though, most recently, one of the team members at Arden was working on some, um, was using a third party package that had an API that they were forced to use that if it failed, it called panic. Think about foundational level code that calls panic when things fail. And guess what? Things fail. This was a total nightmare. No one is allowed to, no foundational or business code 
in general should be allowed to just shut down the app, especially like that. I do believe, though, that code in any layer should have the right to signal a shutdown, to say, I think we have a big problem here, and I think this application needs to be shut down. Signaling a shutdown is fine. Actually doing it has to be localized and controlled and checked. In our case, we're gonna have the web framework actually contain, even though it's a foundation layer, will contain the sh uh, shutdown signaling if it receives a signal of that type. And we'll have some checks and balances around that. We'll implement that first. And then the last um, signal, which we will not implement today, will be data validation signaling. We've got to be able to send an error back to the caller when they give us a data model that's not formatted correctly. So that's another sort of data model validation signal, which we'll get to at some point. Those are the three that I have here um, that we're going to implement. It doesn't mean that you might not have more, but I think those three are core to everything that we do. Okay. With all that being said, let's start with the shutdown signal first. So the question is, do we think that the shutdown error signal, is that foundational or business? I'm gonna make it foundational because I'm gonna integrate it into the web framework. Again, there's no right or wrong answer there, but the more things we put in the foundation, then the stronger the policy is for something, which in sometimes is really good. In other words, but sometimes having such a strong policy on something makes things inflexible, right? In which case we want to move it to the business layer. Business layer means that we're giving every project its ability to define what they want to do in terms of policy. When we put it into the foundation, we're saying, no, you don't get to choose, we're choosing for you. 